America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you for the second half of the Power Hour right here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com and the iHeartRadio app. Glad you are with us on this Tuesday afternoon, wherever you may be. And uh, before the break, first half of the program, we were spending a lot of time discussing and examining in some painstaking detail even, the uh, Second Amendment. Doing so because I have noticed, and you may have too, that throughout this week since the tragic school shootings in, in Florida, that all of the debates, all the arguments, all of the so-called solutions, or many of the so-called solutions that people are coming up with in light of those events seem to be either ignoring the Second Amendment or completely bastardizing it in terms of its meaning. So we wanted to take some time here today and clarify all of that for you, examine all of that for you, and kind of put things back into the proper perspective as we move forward and deal with the vexing questions brought forth by by a tragedy of this nature. And in the first half of the program, we did examine that Second Amendment, and we discussed that the Second Amendment really is meant to be a check and balance. That the reason we have a Second Amendment and the reason it's written as it is was because the founders and the people in America at the time of, of the Constitution's ratification were understandably and rightfully critical or trepidatious about the concept of having a centralized government with a standing army. Again, they'd just gone through this with King George in England. It did not go well, so hey, why would we open ourselves up to that again? And so the Second Amendment was put forth as a counterbalance to that with the understanding that even if we have a standing army, which is essentially what that first phrase of the Second Amendment talks about, that well-regulated militia, that even if we have a standing army, and even if a standing army is necessary to the existence of a free state, that is offset, that is balanced by the fact that the people will be armed and will be armed with the same type of munitions and weaponry that the standing army is. So therefore, a centralized government, no matter how much we might be leery of it, will not actually be able to use its standing army to enforce tyranny on the people because the people will have the weaponry and the ability to fight back and, in fact, dwarf the standing army on that basis. Okay, so that was the point. That was the point. And so that's why it's always been comical to me to see liberals come out after a tragedy like this and talk about, well, AR-15 is a weapon of war! It's a military-grade weapon! It's not meant to be in the hands of civilians! Whoa, 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 whoa! You must not know your Second Amendment! Whether or not an AR-15 is or is not a weapon of war, a military-grade weapon, doesn't really matter. Because our founders intended weapons of war and military-grade weapons to be in the hands of civilians. The idea that there is some sort of a limit to the type of weaponry that the founders intended the people to have is completely bogus. Does not exist. And it shows a crass misunderstanding or perhaps ignorance or ignoring of the Second Amendment itself. So we have established that there is not only intention, but darn good reason for the average citizen, for the regular American, for the civilian to have military-grade weapons. Now, some of you are saying, well, what about machine guns? Weren't those banned? And You can't get those in their legislation on that? Well, yes, there is, and that is very unfortunate. We have, at times in the past in our history, we have gone through periods of what can best be described as fear and paranoia in which we have allowed our Second Amendment rights to be trampled on to a certain degree. And we have allowed legislation to be put into place which is unconstitutional 
but does interfere with our Second Amendment rights. And yes, this has happened a couple of times. Back in the 1930s, when people were so scared of the gangsters and the Al Capones and everything, they brought in uh, legislation that restricted things like Tommy guns and things like that. 1960s, people were so scared about uh, the assassinations. They were shocked by the assassinations. People like John F. Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Bobby Kennedy, that they put forth a lot of the uh, restrictions we have today with the background checks and the things like that. So yes, we've done those things like that. That is true. But those laws have all been unconstitutional and all take away from the intention of the Second Amendment and the reason we have it. And truth be told, at some point, we need to go back and repeal those laws. Yes, you heard that right. I just advocated for repealing the gun regulations that already exist. Machine guns should not be restricted, should not be regulated. There should not be background checks when we go to purchase a firearm. Nothing like that. Now, I'm not saying we're going to do that anytime soon. I'm, I'm not unrealistic. I know that's not going to happen today or anytime in the near future, but it is something that should be on the radar. Radar. But the point being that just because America has made mistakes in the past and allowed our Second Amendment rights to be chipped away at in the past is no justification, is no excuse to allow liberals to do it even further now. My ability to defend myself against criminals, my fellow man, or even the federal government has already been compromised earlier in history. So why should I be okay with it being further compromised now? I'm not. I won't. So the idea of banning an AR-15 or banning an AK-47 is asinine, and there's no legitimate basis for such debate or such discussion. It should be a non-starter when we discuss these issues. Now, in light of this tragedy, and, of course, others in the past, I have often seen liberals and Democrats come out, and we saw it during the last week, hot and heavy, come out and, and blame spineless politicians and the NRA for this issue. Now, setting aside the fact that I greatly disagree with those politicians who want, to, uh, who want to enact any sort of gun legislation. By the way, I hate that term, common sense gun legislation. The only, the only common sense gun legislation out there would be gun legislation that repeals all the other gun legislation we've had so far. That is common sense gun legislation, but no one's, no one's proposing that yet. But when I hear these uh, Democrats and these commentators and these liberals criticize feckless, spineless politicians and the NRA for the lack of movement on gun legislation, I think they're completely misunderstanding the environment that they're in. The NRA is not some giant that can use its money to wield whatever power it wants. The campaign contributions made by the NRA, which have been highlighted by political commentators and, and democratic politicians ad nauseum, those political contributions are dwarfed by the political contributions of unions in American politics. And I'm not complaining about it either way. I think I think people should be able to donate to politicians for whatever reason they want. Use your money as you like. I, I would be a person in favor of getting rid of a lot of the campaign finance laws we have. That's another discussion for another time. I don't have a problem with unions using their money to, to influence politicians any more than anybody else. But to say the NRA is out of line in doing it, well, they're not even, they're not even at the big kids' table. So the NRA doesn't have the power that these Democrats think it does. And these uh, politicians, these Republican politicians that refuse to bring about gun legislation, they're not spineless. No. There's something much deeper that's keeping this from happening, liberals. 
it's the American people. It's us. It's the voters. You see, one thing that the anti-gun Democrats have as a disadvantage, one thing working against them, is that like the party itself, most of the virulent anti-gun voters are concentrated in some very high population areas, but they're not spread out across the country. So, like you saw in the presidential election, and like you saw, like you see with uh, congressional seats and so forth, it's not about how many votes you have or how many voters you have. It's oftentimes about where those voters come from. That's part of the genius of our founding fathers. They constructed a system in which highly populated cities could not run roughshod over the rest of the population, and we benefit from that political system today. So the point being that the voters who are out there, and there are some, of course, who are virulently anti-gun, well, they're all concentrated in roughly the same places. For the rest of us, politicians who come out and say they want to they want to uh, advocate for virulent anti-gun legislation, well, that's career suicide for them. And it doesn't matter what party they're in. Republican, Democrat, does not matter. You look at someone like Claire McCaskill, who is a senator out of Missouri, and someone that, someone that I couldn't warm up to if I was cremated next to her. But she released a statement, or she released a reaction to the shootings. And in her reaction, she talked about wanting to get accurate background checks. Okay, we already have those. And wanting to ban bump stocks, which weren't a factor in this. But I noticed in her statement, she did not go down the road that some of these more vocal Democratic politicians are. She did not talk about banning AR-15s or AK-47s or any kind of gun ban at all or any sort of gun legislation on that end. That doesn't mean that what she said is acceptable, but what it does indicate to me is that she knows what the political environment out here in the great state of Missouri is. And she also knows that she's in a dogfight for her Senate seat come November. And if she came out here on the heels of this and said, look, we need to ban AR-15s, we need to restrict them, we need to blah, 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 her goose would be cooked right now. That election would be over today. She'd be toast. So she didn't go that far. Now, again, I disagree with her ideas about background checks and and bump stocks, but those may be things that a politician could say and get away with in rural Missouri. But if she actually came out and said, no, we need to get rid of these so-called assault weapons, she's done. Over. Toast. Done. Nada. She understands the the lay of the land out here. It's not the NRA keeping her from saying those things. It's not other politicians keeping her from saying those things. It's us. It's the voters. It's the people she's got to appeal to if she wants to hold on to that Senate seat. Likewise, you look at a guy like Joe Manchin in West Virginia. He's a liberal on a lot of issues, but he's never really gotten into the... uh, He's never really gotten into the let's take all the guns away debate. Because he knows if he did, West Virginia would wad him up and toss him out of the window of the car just like they would a Big Mac wrapper. It's not the NRA. It's not the politicians. It's us. You see, guns are a very interesting issue in America in that When we talk about other political issues, there's always some bit of abstractness about it. So, like, when we were debating Obamacare, and liberals said, well, they want to do X, Y, and Z to health care, and Republicans said, no, we don't want to do that. And I'm a voter out there, and I'm looking at all this. I'm trying to analyze it in terms of of abstractness because it hasn't been implemented yet. There's not like a – there's not an over – at the time, there was not an overly tangible way that it was going – that I knew for sure it was going to affect me. It was all speculation. Now, of course, after Obamacare did go into existence, we did see tangible effects of that. And so our, our, our message 
may have been altered by that somewhat, but the point being, most things we talk about in terms of political debate are are speculation, or they're in the future. As a gambler would say, they're on the come. We're speculating what will happen if we do this or if we do that. But guns are different. Because when a politician comes out and says, well, we need to... We need to ban the AR-15. We need to make sure that a civilian can't buy that. There's a whole lot of Americans, there's millions of Americans that can look in their gun safe and see the AR-15 that they use for home defense, recreation, whatever, and see that there is a very tangible impact on their daily lives because of the legislation that's being proposed. That's a different kettle of fish altogether. When you advocate legislation that will take away something from people that they currently possess, that they rely on, that is important to their lives, you're going to get pushback. Take away all the emotion out of it. Take away even the Second Amendment for a moment and ask yourself the question. If a politician comes forth and says to you, I'm going to take away something that you rely on to defend yourself from the criminals and the murderers and the rapists and the illegal aliens and the terrorists that are out there today, and I'm going to take that away from you, how on earth could you be expected to be okay with that? It defies logic. It defies reason. This isn't theory, folks. This isn't abstractness. Some Democrat politicians, backed up by the media, backed up by the journalists, are using this strategy, this tragedy to literally take away from us tools that we have to protect ourselves and our families. Now, I hear people say all the time, you don't need an AR-15, you don't need an AK-47. Well, you can think that if you want, but it's not up to you. The The Second Amendment was not based around need. The Second Amendment does not read the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed so long as it's an arm that we think they need. Absolutely not. Whether you think I need it or not is irrelevant. Whether I actually do need it or not is irrelevant. I can have it. And you can't stop me. Now, there are those, of course, that are blaming the rash of mass shootings we've seen in the last two decades on your AR-15s, your AK-47s, your availability of guns, the gun culture, blah, 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 blah. You've heard it a million times. But I want to propose a question to you. We have had guns in this country from day one. One could even argue that we've had easier access to guns in our country at earlier times in our history. I mean, after all, did did people in the 1830s have to undergo a background check to buy a rifle? No! You went, you put your money down, you got your rifle. So have we had this rash of mass shootings all 240 years that we've been in existence? No, we haven't. So clearly something changed somewhere along the line. It wasn't the guns. We've had the guns from day one. Now someone's going to say, well, we haven't had AR-15 since day one. We haven't had AK-47 since day one. We haven't had semi-automatic weapons since day one. Oh, we've had them a lot longer than these string of mass shootings have come about. We've had things like uh, similar to AR-15s from the early 60s. 
we have had semi-automatic handguns since, what, the early 1900s, maybe before? And yet we didn't see these things. The problem is not the guns. The the thing that changed was not the guns. The thing that changed was not the type of guns or the access to the guns. In fact, the access to the guns is less now than it used to be. That isn't what changed. What did change? What changed over the last 50 years was our general cultural attitudes and the way that we teach our children. You see, I grew up in a rural school district where you could walk through the parking lot on a school day and see pickup trucks with gun racks in them and rifles hanging in the window. We never had a school shooting. Nobody would ever conceptualized such a thing when I was there, there was never a problem. Why? Because we all had been taught right and wrong. Because, yes, we all believed in God. And, and, and this is going to ruffle some people the wrong way, but the place I grew up in was very much a Christian area. There weren't, there weren't a whole lot of different belief systems competing with each other. There wasn't a whole lot of different tolerance and acceptance for you know, Muslims or atheists or whatever. No, we all believed in God. Now, granted, you had all your different denominations of church. You'd have your General Baptists over here and your Southern Baptists over there and your Pentecostals over there. And there was a Catholic church on the side of town, but no one ever acknowledged they existed. And, but everybody was, you had your Mormons over here. But everybody, generally speaking, believed the same, the same things in terms of right and wrong. There was no moral relativism. And the religious and moral beliefs we had were not forced to be were not forced to be checked at the school door. They were a part of our lives, in the classroom and out. Right and wrong was consistent from the church you went to, to what your parents taught you, to what your teachers taught you at school. There was no There was no area in which we said, okay, your moral beliefs are fine, but you've got to discount them if you're going to get into politics. Or you've got to discount them if you're going to talk about science. No. Right was right and wrong was wrong. And it was consistent throughout and we didn't have issues like this. But I was in a rural area. I was the exception to the rule, you see. During that same time, the rest of the country was going through all this moral relativism crap, all this multiculturalism, all of this tolerance. Oh, we have to accept that there's 487 different genders out there. We have to accept Muslim terrorists. We have to accept that all religions and all belief systems and all cultures have value, which is absolute and complete garbage. So when you're raised in an environment like that, massive amounts of kids raised that way Not knowing a concept of solid right and wrong. Knowing only a concept of moral relativism and tolerance. When something goes wrong in their lives, when they have a problem, what do they have to cling on to? And I'm not being sympathetic to any of these shooters. Not at all, because you're responsible for your actions. But that having been said, understanding the crucible from which our kids have been formed in the last 50 years is critical. And when you grow up, millions of kids growing up without a solid moral and religious basis for right and wrong, can you be shocked that there are the mass shootings we see? I'm kind of, I hate to say it, I'm surprised there aren't more of them, quite frankly, because what have we given our children of value to grasp onto? We haven't forced them to... to force them to engage in religion and Christianity. We haven't enforced them to engage in right and wrong. We've told them to be tolerant of everything that's wrong in this world. Well, can we be surprised when it bites us in the ass? Here's where your answer is. You've got to go back to who we were as a nation, not who we are today. But what have we learned from liberals this week? When confronted with the vexing questions of what do we do about this mass shooting problem? 
what we have learned from liberals is that their answer to the problem, their only answer to the problem, is to reduce the firepower that law-abiding citizens and potential victims have available to them to fight back with. That is unacceptable, because I will say this bluntly and coherently, and I think I'm backed up by millions of other Americans in saying it. I don't care what theory you have about the greater good of society. I will not, under any circumstances, sacrifice my safety and security or the safety and security of my family and loved ones for your stupid utopia. It's not going to happen. You aren't going to get the guns from us. It's not the NRA's fault. It's not the politicians' fault. We're the ones you got to deal with on that regard. That's it for this week. I hope I've helped put some things into perspective. I'm Travis Cook, America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week. God bless you.